Hey, database experts and app developers. Do you want to build faster and run bigger workloads? We've got you covered with an exclusive free download of Datastax Enterprise. Datastax Enterprise works with all the latest tools like Kafka and Docker with incredible throughput and the best security. Download Datastax Enterprise for free today by visiting Datastax, that's D-A-T-A-S-T-A-X dot com slash download D-S-E. That's the Datastax Enterprise for free. Visit datastax.com slash download D-S-E. I'm Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hanselman. Today I'm talking with Ruben Harris. He's the CEO at Career Karma. You're a Y Combinator company. How does that work? Well, essentially, you have to go through a process of interviewing with Y Combinator and meeting a bunch of objectives. But um, yeah, we, we got into it. Uh, we got rejected the first time, but we applied again in the same year and got in. It was a, it's a grueling process, but totally worth it. Well, that's actually a good segue because you bring up a couple things there. Getting rejected more than, you know, getting rejected once and then also the idea of a grueling process because Career Karma is an app that helps job training programs, boot camps find, you know, qualified applicants. And I'm sure that as people are trying to get into tech, they're going to get knocked down a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. I mean, to your point, you know, job training programs are trying to identify people that want to take control of their careers, but individuals themselves also want to take control of their careers. And so several people that come to Career Karma have tried to become software engineers before, and we don't just match them with the right job training, but we put them through a three-week process called the 21-Day CK Challenge that helps them create a habit, but also gives them support through a small group called a squad of other people like them that have done it before. Mm. When I ins- I installed it, I uh, hope you don't mind, but I t- pretended to be a person trying to get into tech. And right off the bat, I was kind of impressed with the, like, I almost felt like I got a hype group for me there just within a couple, like people called me, people were texting me, there was chats. I mean, if you're lacking or if you're struggling with any kind of internal motivation, you definitely have a squad that is hyping you up through you know, every day, all day, like letting you know that you can do it and then providing you with like measurable and specific resources to go in and make it happen. Yeah, I'm glad that you downloaded the app. You know, a lot of people like to see things from the outside, but it's, it's a very different experience feeling it. I think scaling human to human connection is difficult. However, even though we have an app and it's technology driven, at the end of the day, it's all about relationships. And so we are working on figuring out how to help people help people. Um, and we tell people we're not teaching you how to work for companies. We're teaching you how to work for each other. Hmm. There's definitely a vibe of positivity uh, that you get in the app. And there's like almost 400 squads that are all different groups. And I'm a big fan of the idea of a squad because you know, it could be people that look like you, people who are from your town, people who are your age. I mean, it really is up to you to self-select. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think if you think about where people get their best friends from, it's usually through going through struggle. And trying to do something hard, like becoming a software engineer, is a struggle for many. And so through the process of acquiring skills that are difficult, you're going to meet your best friends. A lot of times in the corporate world, You'll say, you know, your best friends came from college, but if you never went to college, where do your best friends come from? It's usually through, you know, sports or family or the neighborhood or gang even uh, because you guys went through hard times. Mm. You know, that's actually interesting that you bring that up with because my entree into into tech was not typical. I didn't go to a four-year school. I was working full time right out of high school and never actually did the college experience where you have like, you know, be in a dorm, join a fraternity or, you know, spend time with people at that level. Everything I did was working at night. So the people that I ended up being friends with were people who were, you know, in the middle of the hustle with me trying to Uh make it happen because the traditional four year college did not work out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. 
when I'm looking through your list of squads here, you've got, uh, you had like moms who code, you got great, you know, code gray. I love this. People who are 55 and older, um, Mm -hmm. vets who code, like you, you've, you've got every kind of group of people that, um, dads who code, um, -hmm. are these self-selected or did you all make these yourself? They're self-selected. If you think about uh, my co-founders and I, which I didn't talk about, but we, we met in Atlanta, Georgia. We moved to the Bay Area without knowing anybody. And essentially, we figured out how to break into tech. And if you think about us, um, after we, we did boot camps, we were essentially like the original squad. We've been through ups and downs. We've been through startups doing well and startups not doing so well. We've been through layoffs. And essentially, we built career karma as the product that we wish that we had when we were breaking into tech. And so squads actually started off on their own. The first squad was FFT. And you can hear about that story on the Breaking Stars podcast. And it was a group of people from different boot camps that essentially created a study group and started creating their own bylaws and meetings and things like that. And through learning from them and how they structured it, we built that as a feature into the app that has blown up into what it is right now. The uh, one of the things that I was impressed about the app, and I'm not, I'm trying to find my way around it, is it's very it's very interesting. Your whoever's doing your UX is really clever because it's very like how can I express this? It's very like homey and friendly, but it's also walking you along a path. It's 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 linear, but you don't feel like you're being moved along a path, kind of like in an aggressive way. It's just like okay, mm-hmm. it's a new day, and here's what we're going to do today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that's by design. Uh, so Timor, uh, who's our chief product officer, um, who, who loved that feedback. So it's good that you shared that. Um, he thinks a lot about gaming and he thinks mm-hmm. a lot about, you know, workout apps. He thinks a lot about things like Duolingo that took things that were um, normally hard for people, um, but they, they were able to accomplish big things but it didn't, they did it without even realizing that it was hard. It's like a child learning a, a language like Japanese when they're a baby. Like mm-hmm. they just do it because they're like in the environment and they didn't know it was hard. It wasn't in their mind where it would have to be hard and things like that. So essentially we study a lot of those types of things. And so um, that's, that's all by design. So like right now I'm looking at mine, I think I'm on day three or four here, and it says I've got some conversations that are going. It was funny, I was actually talking with uh, one of your founders, Archer, and I'm afraid, I hope he's not offended, but I asked him if he was a bot because <laughs> he he was like, hey, you know, are you interested in learning how to code? And he was chatting me and I just said, bot? And he said, nope, I'm real. I just get that a lot. There's a, there's a, there's a light touch and a personal touch that's almost so real that I think in this world of bots, we're all suspicious that, you know, it can't scale. The personal touch can't scale. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, that's a, that's an interesting point. I mean, cause I, we're building technology that isn't just helping people take control of their careers and helps job training programs find qualified applicants, but we're also building software that helps us coach people and mentor people mm-hmm. in a scalable way. Um, and, and we get that a lot to the point where some people think that this is even the scam. It's like, how is it possible that you're even talking to me and you guys are doing this all the time? Um, and that's honestly the only reason I'm able to be able to speak with over 100 people a day. I've been doing this since April 2018 is through the technology that we've built. So, yeah. So you are, you're, have, you're hosting, like, for example, here on the homepage of the app, you've got an event later this evening where you're going to do a kickoff mm-hmm. you're doing these regular mm-hmm. kickoff kickoff events where you're making yourself available to you know all these thousands and thousands of people that are on career karma and you're scaling this through these webinars and these events yeah yeah every night 6 p.m uh, west coast time we have uh, something called the ceo kickoff uh, you talked about what combinator earlier um, they talk about making something that people want and making something that people need and yes we we have gone through the process of being in a boot camp. Um, you could think about Y Combinator like a boot camp for entrepreneurs. Um, but even though we've been through this experience of trying to take control of our career and breaking into tech, the world changes. Everything is always changing. And so what we went through is still different than others. And so it's very important to constantly be talking to your users. Um, they have something called doing things that don't scale. 
Um, and, and the best source of information from people is going to be by talking to them um, about their problems and not prescribing your own solutions that they didn't ask for. Um, and so pretty much day in, day out, we're writing code and talking to users. That's pretty much what we do all day, mm-hmm. day in, day out. Yeah, one of the things as I'm going through my, my daily assignment here is there's discussions of accountability. And mm-hmm. there's discussions of like you know, you're not, I wouldn't say you're like warning them it's going to be hard, but I think you're giving them a level of structure that is making it clear that we're not messing around here. And if you don't follow through with this, this, this checklist, if you don't make a forward, you know, some positive forward motion every single day, then you probably are not going to be as successful as if you did. Yeah. A thousand percent. I mean, a lot of people ask like, well, what's the, what's the success rate of people going through career karma? And honestly, like if you, don't quit. There's a hundred percent success rate and a hundred percent failure rate. If you do, you know, if you, we're never going to give up on you and everybody has different paces during the process. But when we check in on you, we're going to learn what's changed and we're going to give you something to make you better in that day. If you don't do it, then you're going to be stuck in the same place every day. That doesn't mean that you're a bad person. That doesn't. That just means you don't want it bad enough, you know. If it, like or life life happened or it's not the right time to do it, you know. A question I ask on the CEO Kifkoff is, if I give you a million dollars to do t- the twenty one day challenge, five minutes a day, every day, back to back, would you do it? And everybody says yes enthusiastically. And I say, what if your phone blew up or fell in the toilet? Would you still figure it out? They say absolutely. Well, if you could do it with a million dollar incentive, you should be able to do it without one. You just don't want it bad enough. Hmm. That's a that's a that's a slippery slope, though, wouldn't you say? I mean, it's, like you said, life does happen. We've got single parents. We got people working two jobs, wanting it bad enough. Like willpower, I think, is like a well, and you have to refill the well sometimes. Is is being in a squad, or what are things within career karma that can help you uh, refill your own willpower well? Yeah, so if you look at day seven of the 21-day challenge, it talks about the importance of breaks um, and, and taking the importance of refreshing, right? So mm-hmm. uh, like I said before, it's like, it's not, we're not telling people commit to four hours a day immediately. It's five minutes every day. And everybody mm-hmm. has 168 hours in a week. Yes, in the beginning, there's a lot of engagement and activity, but we don't dive people right into the world of coding. We just, five minutes. Mm-hmm. No, just check it out, talk to some people, dip your toes, play around. Um, And to your point, life happens. It doesn't always have to happen back to back. Since I've been running a company, it's been difficult for me to be back to back in the gym as much as I like to. But as we're going through this process, you know, if I'm telling people to be consistent in their path of coding, then I should be consistent with things in my own life, despite everything else going on. And so we don't make you feel like a bad person if you don't do it. But we will constantly remind you that if you want to do this, then try this. Um, the other thing that we do, too, is to your point, is we want to people people to think less of coding as like just a way to make a lot of money. And if mm-hmm. they trust the process, yeah, they will actually make a million dollars if they stick in the job for five, 10 years, making over $100,000. But that's not the goal. You know, money is a means. It's not an end. Um, and so we, we talk deeper about deeper things that go beyond money. Yeah, I mean, you have to you have to explore people's motivations. Why is someone doing this? What is the, you know, what is the ultimate goal? But at the same time, I think it's probably valid to, if you want to make a bunch of money. That's certainly a reasonable thing, right? That's yeah. a reasonable enough reason to get into tech. You don't have to like people. People always sometimes try to imply that you're not you're not a real developer if, and then they give yeah. you some some nonsense about why you're not a real developer. Like, yeah, you don't have to work on this stuff after five if you're not passionate about it. I mean, my yeah. wife's a nurse. She's not necessarily like thinking about nursing when she's, you know, on the weekend, like nursing as a, as a hobby. You know what I mean? It is yeah. her job. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, we also tell people that like, you're not a, you're not a developer the day that you get paid to become a developer. You're a developer the day you write your first line of code. You know, mm. you could be a struggling artist for years um, and you can't play the, the best music in the world, but would you consider yourself an artist? Yeah, if you've never been paid to be play music, would you consider yourself an artist? Yeah, I play guitar. Okay, cool. Then like, why do we have to like wait to be paid to do something to be define ourselves as that? That's 
that's not how you should be thinking about things. Like if you typed hello world, like you're a coder now. Mm. That's a kind of good attitude and like, you know, sense of inclusion that I think is really positive. Like, I mean, I've been coding for 30 years, but I'm literally learning stuff three, four, five times a week. And I in no way am an expert in a whole bunch of stuff. It's such a huge thing. That's the thing about coding, unlike a lot of other environments, is that there's so much to know that if Mm -hmm. you think you'll never know it all. And by the time you do, there'll be some new thing that just came out the next day. Exactly. Exactly. It never ends. And that's the that's the beautiful part about it. It's like you're always going to grow. You're not going to stay stagnant. Mm -hmm. Hey, friends, I want to introduce a new sponsor to you. HMA VPN. It's a VPN you can count on. As you know, I do a lot of travel and I tend to connect to a lot of untrusted wireless networks and I probably shouldn't. But I can use HMA as the world's largest VPN service. It offers the most server locations worldwide. It covers 190 countries there's always a server nearby. It doesn't log your IP address. It's got full network connection. It allows me to connect five devices simultaneously. It works on basically all platforms, Android, iOS, Mac, Linux, Windows, routers, wherever. It's actually been completely redesigned recently to make it even simpler and more fun to use. And there's even a smart kill switch that'll turn the VPN automatically on when you launch sensitive apps. Here's your call to action, my friends. Try HMA. VPN risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. This deal is for Hanselman and its listeners. That's hmavpn.com slash offer hyphen Hanselman. That's hmavpn.com slash offer dash Hanselman. So as you walk through this process, you find your squad, you express to them how to manage their time, how to work through their own schedule and figure out when they can find those five minutes until they build those five minutes up into some number of hours. Uh, then you talk to them about evaluating boot camps, evaluating these technical schools, because they're not all the same. And mm-hmm. people need to find you know, the culture fit that, that works for them. Why aren't all boot camps the same? And how would someone decide what, which one to go to? That's a great question. Um, I think job training programs like coding boot camps that teach you exactly what companies need in a short amount of time are in vogue and I think are going to continue to grow in popularity. And because of that, now that there are hundreds and of programs um, that exist in the United States, um, some say there's some reports that say thousands, but let's say hundreds of boot camps that exist that are higher quality, it's very difficult for someone to choose. There's a lot of psychological things around um, paralysis by analysis, like where you can Google learn to code and then you have thousands of options and you just don't do anything because you don't know what's out there. Mm-hmm. The reason why there's so many different types of learning is because people are different, right? And some people prefer an online program. Some people prefer an offline program. Some people want to do something full-time. Sometimes people want to do something part-time. Sometimes people want to do self-paced. Sometimes people have money in their pocket to be able to pay for school. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes people have loans already. So, and they don't want to take on any more loans. So even if you can create a scholarship or get your company to pay for it or the government provides some type of thing for you, even if you have the school for free, you still got to live. So you might need housing or you might need a job so you can earn a check while you learn it. So, you know, you might need a connection with the company. So there, there's all kinds of different reasons why there's different types of job training. The problem that I would say that a lot of people face in addition to selecting which job training program is best for their learning style is that there are schools that take advantage of people that are desperate to take control of their career and will mm. take advantage of you and scam you for your money and not get wow. you a job. Yeah, like that's that's a fact. Like there's definitely, there's just like, and you could, you could even say that with like some colleges, right? There's, you know, for-profit colleges that have said, we will get you this degree and that means you're going to get a job. So take out hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans and then you'll be fine. But the reason why our student loan amount is $1.6 trillion in America for 45 million Americans is because for most people, that promise never came. They never got the job that was able to pay off the debt. And that's where we are. And so if you're someone that's trying to evaluate bootcamp programs, the ultimate measure of success is outcomes. How many people have they placed into companies? Not placement rate, like 
do they have a deep well of alumni that are working in companies, right? Because if you think about, if you just look at placement rate, that's kind of like looking at, all right, well, you know, these people got placed, but you're also not seeing like how many people that graduated or were in the program that like dropped out in the middle of it. It might have been for legitimate reasons like life, like someone might have passed away, or it might have been just like they gave up, right? It's like how many people sign up to the gym at the beginning of the year and then end up um, still in the gym by the end. So I think a school that says that they're going to get you jobs should be able to point to people that have jobs at companies that you want to work for. That's Mm -hmm. the ultimate. Then you want to talk to people that have been through the program. You want to talk to people that are currently in the program because the program changes over time. And you want to talk to people that are evaluating the program as well. You also want to um, evaluate the way that they teach to see if it's receptive with your learning style uh, because um, you're inevitably going to have to learn new languages. And so the way that they teach you concepts um, is going to be really important. And you want to understand what they offer that's not listed on their website because going back to everything changing, schools and boot camps are going to be constantly iterating based off of feedback that they get from people and things that companies need. So often they're launching new scholarship programs, new initiatives to help people, and you will never figure those out without talking to them. And so sometimes you self-limit yourself by not talking to the school and just judging that everything the school has to offer is on their website, so you need to talk to them. Yeah, I really feel like the importance of actually talking to humans, looking them in the eye, like this is not a decision that one should take lightly, and it's not a decision that they can make necessarily just by reading the brochure where yeah. on the website. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And we're, we're going to put come out with a pretty big guide talking about um, how to pick, like I have a YouTube video on youtube.com slash career come about how to pick a coding bootcamp that breaks down how to pick a coding bootcamp, but we're also going to come out with a guide about this as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as I'm going through the the process here on the learn section of the app, uh, day four, I'm going to evaluate the boot camps. On day five, you talk about income sharing mm-hmm. because if folks want to get a job in tech, they they may not have any resources right now. But the assumption is that they're going to get a job in tech, they're going to make a decent salary. And what 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 is ISA? What is an income share agreement? And how to do? Because you're basically betting on all these folks doing well. Mm-hmm. And then that's how the boot camp, and that's how ultimately you will, will get some money to keep the lights on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So income share agreements are essentially study now, pay later models. I mean, going back to career karma, um, being the product that we wish that we had when we were breaking into tech, um, my co-founders, Archer, who's our chief technology officer and his twin brother did boot camps. And they did both options. Uh, Archer did Hack Reactor, where he paid up front, um, I think it was like $18,000. And then Timor did App Academy, which was essentially a deferred tuition ISA model that essentially promises to get you a job above a certain salary. And if you don't get a job, you don't pay a dime. My brother did App Academy as well, um, ended up getting a job that paid him about $150,000 with uh, no experience. And then he paid back about $26,000. Um, and so Essentially, that's what income share agreements are, where they focus on you getting a job um, and above a certain salary. Sorry about that. Uh, getting a job above a certain salary, and if you don't get a job, you don't pay it down. Hmm. And then you can pay over a period of time with a percentage of one salary, and then you can set a a cap. So the percentage is meant to be. Uh, you know, kind of like not quite a tax, but it's, you know, it's a percentage that is over a period of time. And then if you make more and then you can pay it off quicker and then you hit a cap, then you're done and you're good. Yeah. So I, have, I have a video about this as well called how income sharing works, but the four triggers mm-hmm. for an income share agreement is um, a guaranteed salary, a percentage of tuition that you pay, a duration of, of time and a cap, which is the most that you would ever pay. So you will always know the most that you would ever pay. So Just to use simple math, let's say I'm going to promise to get you a job of $50,000. The percentage of tuition is 10%. Um, The duration of time is three years. I'm in the cap is 30,000. So let's say my sister is inspired by my brother and she wants to do the same thing that my brother did and she gets a job 
making $150,000 and she's paying 10% of tuition. That's above the $50,000 promise. Um, she's paying 15,000 a year. After two years, she's paid 30,000, but the income share agreement is three years. But since she hit the cap in two years, she's done in two. Let's say mm. that for some reason, like you said, she's a, she, my sister's a mom, she just had a baby. Um, and she's just desperate for money. She's in Florida right now. Um, and and fifty thousand dollars is, is good. So that's so let's she she takes a fifty thousand dollar job, and so now she's paying five thousand a year. After three years, she's paid fifteen thousand dollars. So that's not the thirty thousand dollar cap, but because she hit the duration of time, she's done. So she ends up paying less than thirty thousand dollars. So it's either you're paying less than the amount or the cap, depending on how much you're making. And if you make a lot of money out of your first job, which some people make two. $200,000, then you're not going to be paying an exorbitant amount and you're protected with the cap. There's no interest. If you get laid off uh, or you quit your job, you're not paying the ISA. You're only paying it when you're in a job. Mm -hmm. And you've also called out, I'm looking on your blog, we have a whole blog about this that we'll include into the show notes on income sharing agreements that you know some boot camps will even set you up for success and make sure that if you don't find a job making a certain amount of money within certain years of graduating, then you would not be required to pay until then. Yeah. And there's also some, thank, thank you for including that. There's also uh, some boot camps that will even give you money back guarantees as well. So let's say that you decided to pay tuition up front and take out a loan. Some boot camps will even give you your money back because that's how they hold themselves accountable. That's how you know that a school really holds themselves accountable is if they're willing to not charge you if they don't deliver on you getting a job. That's the ultimate measure of success. Yeah. And that is the thing, right? Like if, if this were, if these systems were scammy or turned out um, unhelpful, then we would all start hearing about it because we'd have people who don't have jobs yeah. and they would be forced to pay back. The ultimate goal of career karma and presumably all the boot camps is make people successful, stand on their own two feet and, you know, make you know make a good career in tech yeah i think also like i think if you look at higher education income share agreements are spreading across colleges as well and we're, really I, yeah and so if you look at the um the state of income share agreements report that we did um which is the most comprehensive in the industry um colleges themselves are um starting to launch income share agreements and i think that our entire higher education model is going to be going towards an outcomes driven uh, method. And if you don't, then, I mean, people are going to believe you don't hold their interests accountable. And mm -hmm. I think ISAs are going to be table, table stakes or some kind of outcomes driven thing with table stakes. You know, I, I, that's interesting. I like the way that that's phrased. Like it is all in branding, but the, you know, income sharing agreement, it is a, uh, you know, we're paying it forward. It's a loan that's going to come due at some point, but the way you phrase it, they're outcome driven. Like the whole point is, be successful. And if you're successful, then you pay your, you pay back. Yeah. But if you're not, then we need to figure out why you're not successful, then make you successful, and then you pay it back. Yeah. Like, we, what we don't want is crushing loans that are tearing people down while they're trying to get up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Definitely. That's, that's really interesting. I wish that something like that was available when I was trying to <laughs> go to school at night. Um, it was a, a, a different time, definitely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What about for the, the the tech? How do you let people decide what tech to, to go into, whether it's Ruby or Python, or, or how do you make those kind of decisions? That's a common question, and we encourage people not to get caught up with that and to focus on the job training program that is has the teaching style that is best aligned with them and that they focus on their own learning style. And I always use the example of my co-founders, again, on which um, Archer's uh, bootcamp that he went to was teaching JavaScript. Um, T. Moore's was teaching Ruby and Python. And they both ended up becoming full stack engineers and got to the same place. There's going to be a bunch of different languages that are out there. But because boot camps are talking to companies about exactly what you need in order to be successful, you're going to be able to get a job no matter which one you pick. And so what you want to really focus on is which job training program is most aligned with your teaching style. And we encourage people not to get caught up in languages. Yeah, I think that's really great. I mean, the, the point is to teach people how to think 
teach people how to learn to set them up for what I call and what I've actually had a great podcast with Keisha Rogers who talked about systems thinking. You got to teach people how to think and how to think about systems. And the language really is secondary. Yeah. When we're moving forward with uh, with a project like this, is this a year long project? Is this weeks? How long into into coding karma, uh, into career karma rather, does it go until you start really having to, you know, basically uh, make it happen or step off? Like it seems like the first week is pretty casual. Um, it's like reflection, thinking about it, preparing to make action. When does it get hard, and when do people fall off? Yeah, I would say after week one. When people start talking to boot camps and they they finish the first interview. So the first interview, you could think about it like a a digital campus visit uh, where you're talking mm. to the school about what makes them different from each other and what they offer that's not online. Mm. That's pretty casual conversation. And then they usually receive a conditional acceptance. And essentially what the school is looking for is let's use you as an example, is, is Scott someone that's going to start and finish my program and not quit? And then mm -hmm. they're asking you questions about that. Like, why do you want to learn how to code? What have you done related to coding and things like that? And then on your end, you're also interviewing the school with this campus visit. And you're like, well, you know, I really like you, but I'm also talking to these schools. What makes you different from them? Right. So you want to mm -hmm. make sure that make they're, them compete. yeah, exactly. You want to make them compete and sell themselves to you. That's a pretty casual conversation, but then you get a bunch of different conditional offers and the schools have different prep work that you have to take in order to pass the technical exams. And so for most people uh, doing the prep work, which is usually about 75 to 80 hours, uh, which is mm -hmm. about a, you can, most people do it in, a, in, it can be done in a week because you have under 68 hours in a week, but most people get it done within two to four weeks. Essentially, mm -hmm. once you're done with that, um, then you can take the the exam. But I'll say that's usually where people fall off is through the pre-training work um, that you need in order to pass the technical exam. And, mm -hmm. and it's not because they're not ready. There's a lot of people that have finished the technical work and have gone through the digital campus visit um, and the first interview and got conditionally accepted, but they won't take the exam because they're nervous. And I'm not talking about just like people that are marginalized. I'm talking about MBAs. I'm talking about grown men. I'm talking about uh, women. Like every, everybody you can imagine, the the most confident people that you would imagine are extremely intimidated by boot camps and just tech. I mean, the word boot camp is scary. It sounds like Navy SEAL training. It's true though. Like we have made tech such that if I, if I'm at a barbecue with 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 like non technical neighbors. And they say, oh, what do you do? And I say, oh, I work for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. They'll say, oh, you're a computer person. I'm not a computer person. Mm -hmm. or I'm not technical. And they've immediately othered my, me and othered themselves mm -hmm. because we've made it like it's some secret uh, handshake, some mm -hmm. secret club. Mm -hmm. And and then then it's just us and them, the techies yeah. and the non-techies. And that's the exact opposite of what we're trying to do here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so interesting to me, like especially just being – living in the Bay Area for the last five years and just seeing like all my friends that are Bay Area natives, like that live in, that are from San Francisco or Oakland or Palo Alto that have seen all the changes in tech, but haven't been able to take a part of it, even though they want to. In the beginning, it was, they don't know how, but even when they know how and they have the path, they have the steps in front of them it's scary to walk those lines. Well, and that is why I need to get my squad. I'm looking here. See, people have been, I've gotten text messages. Mm -hmm. I've gotten a phone call. Mm -hmm. I've gotten emails all from Career Karma trying to encourage me mm -hmm. to to make it happen. And that's what it's all about. Exactly. Exactly. I'll, and to your point, like, you guys, I, I didn't fully answer your question, but you said, like, how long is this, like, Going through 21 days and getting into into a boot camp is just the beginning. You know, we provide wraparound mm -hmm. support for you during the boot camp, after the boot camp, and, and the vision is to be able to help you for the rest of your life. And the, there's a reason why we're not called Code Karma. Um, we eventually want to do this for every skill set, um, but we're starting mm -hmm. with software engineering, which is the hardest, um, but um, not impossible to figure out because we've done it for many people. 
you know, when my wife quit her job and j- completely changed from one career to another, to go from being an MBA and a finance person to being a, a, a medical surgical nurse, I think that she could have used a squad because she, she was just she and I, uh, and a lot of late nights. So that's really cool that you're going to hopefully uh, branch out into careers in general. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that. I mean, part of the other reason why we have a squad is not just for the um, psychological motivation, but also I can never relate to a mom because I'm not a mom. So I don't, I don't mm-hmm. know the things that moms go through to manage their day, right? Right. You know, I can talk to them as best that I can and ask them and try my best. But if I'm in a squad with other moms that figured it out, then they can tell me what they did. Right. Same thing with the veteran or that might have suffered from PTSD or blah, blah, blah with the dad. And so, you know, these squads allow you to save time by learning from best practices of other people that structured their day in a way that made the impossible possible. Very cool. Thank you so much. Ruben Harris, CEO at Career Karma, for talking to me today. Thank you, brother. I appreciate the time and, and the in-depth breakdown. We've never done that. That was awesome. I appreciate that. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.